Welcome to the Gamer's Tavern. You may notice that we skipped an episode. There was an audio issue with the recording of episode 23 that's going to take a little more time than my normal editing schedule. So rather than make you wait, we're skipping straight ahead to episode 24. This week, we are talking about how to make great player characters, and we have two amazing guests for the show, award-winning author Elizabeth Baer and the award-winning producer, writer, and star of the web series Standard Action, Joanna Gaskell. They joined the award-winning game designer and host Ross Watson and uh, non-award-winning me, Daryl Mott Jr. Um, I, I, I think I'm going to go grab a drink from the bar. Uh, the first round's on me. Then go ahead and take a seat at the table in the corner, and we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Drive Through RPG is the place to go to purchase digital copies of your favorite games. Dungeons and Dragons, Shadowrun, World of Darkness, Savage Worlds, Numenera, Fate, and so many more. Do you long for the feel of actual paper in your hands? Well, they sell physical products too. Just go to GamersTavern.org and click on the link in the show notes to find your favorite games and support the podcast with every purchase. Hello and welcome to episode 24 of the Gamers Tavern. I'm Ross Watson, your host. And I'm Daryl Mott Jr. And tonight we have with us two fantastic ladies in the area of gaming and geekdom. We have with us uh, celebrated author Elizabeth Baer. Hi. And up-and-coming actress Joanna Gaskell. Hello. Thanks for coming on the show, ladies. It's wonderful to have you join us tonight. Well, I'm thank you to be here. Yes. <laughs> Tonight's show is going to be all about making fun player characters. But before we jump into our main topic, uh, we here at the podcast, we like to kind of tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and where they might know you from, especially in the world of gaming or geekdom. So if you could... And I'm going to start with Joanna. If you could uh, give us your gaming character sheet, please. (laughs) Okay. Well, I'm the the producer and the writer and one of the lead actors of the web series Standard Action, uh, which is a D&D-based comedy fantasy. Uh, I'm also one of the hosts of Starlet Citadel Reviews, which is a board game review show that's got about 90 episodes out at this point. I do a lot of other things, too, but those are the big ones. Awesome. I, I actually, uh, that's, that's so cool. You're actually writing the, the standard action stuff. I'm really excited to see what's coming up with that. Yes, yeah. Um, season three is in post-production right now, and it is so good. I'm so excited. <laughs> and if we were to look for you on the web, we would find you where? Uh, well, you can find standard action at standardaction.com. Uh, you can find me at joannagaskell.com. Uh, you can go to YouTube and you can find all of our stuff either on the uh, Standard Action channel, uh, which is called Phase Fire Films, or uh, Starlit Citadel YouTube channel as well. You can go and watch all the reviews. And that's Outstanding. Phase P H A S E Fire Films. That's right. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay, and Elizabeth Bear, what is your gaming character sheet like? I'm a I'm a third level rock climber and an eleventh level nerd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, I am a uh, science fiction and fantasy writer. Uh, I am a I've I've been a, a gamer since I was in sixth grade. Although being a girl, I was a freshman in high school until I could find anybody to play with me. <laughs> I had to, I had to wait for the other gamers to discover girls. Uh, <laughs> um, my current series uh, is a trilogy from from Tor Books called the Eternal Sky Trilogy. The first book, Range of Ghosts, was out in 2012, and the third one comes out uh, April 8th. And I have, I have been completely driving all of my colleagues nuts because I've been bragging up the fact that this is the, the first epic fantasy in the history of the universe to be delivered on time <laughs> <laughs> and come out on schedule. And it's finished in three books. And we won't talk about the fact that the third book was a hundred page longer than, than it was supposed to be, but. That's still That's better. Not bad. That's not <laughs> I'm still bad. not doing bad. You finished. You finished a hundred pages late. You didn't finish a hundred books late. Yes, exactly. So I've been spending my spare time uh, watching out for hunter killer drones from my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm currently at, at work on a book called Karen Memory, which is steampunk saloon girls fighting crime. 
in the Wild West, and I am also involved in a, a project called Shadow Unit, www.shadowunit.com, which is, uh, .org, I'm sorry, .com is a band, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, if, if there's not a band called Shadow Unit, there really should be. I mean, well, there, there, there's, there's got to be some subset of Rule 34 that now that I've said there is, one will mysteriously generate if it hasn't already. <laughs> The cool thing about that is that it, it's an intensely collaborative, episodic, multi-writer web serial that functions sort of like a TV show and sort of like a role-playing game where we're all game mastering simultaneously. And my my current favorite game, although it's not really a role-playing game, is uh, the... It's one part exercise app and, and one part game, uh, Zombies Run, just huh. the thing I'm I'm totally obsessed with currently. Basically, the more you exercise, the more story they tell you. Huh. It's surprisingly effective. Yes. <laughs> I, I may have to go check this out after. You, you, and you, I was going to say, I think our listeners really need to know that uh, Elizabeth Fair is not just she, – she's not just like an, ac, uh, an author who, who writes a book or two. She's got, as far as I can tell, over 30 different novels that are out and has have been out in the last nine years, which is – and how many Hugo Awards now? Well, some of yeah. those are some of those are developed for for Hugos. Only two for yeah, fiction. I, two two are for podcasts. <laughs> I, I am officially the only person on this show who has not won an award. Aww. For the record, we can fix well, that. Sure, I'm sure you Ross won some actually, kind of award sometime, like back well, in the I, day. I got a spelling bee in second grade. There you go. Hugo, there you Hugo there nominations you are. are still open. For the, <laughs> Let's talk about that podcast category. It's it's worked out well for me. Yeah, well, you know, hey, podcasting is a thing, and uh, we're hoping to you know reach more people uh, in this new media era. And I'm we're just like I said, we're glad to have both you guys on because you are both kind of leading the way in that in that forefront. I would say in some in some cases, certainly with standard action being a web a web series that you know this was never around uh, 10, 20, uh, 15 years ago. Back Five when, years ago, even. Yeah. A, dr- a dramatic web series? Yeah. It's a new thing. Yeah, no, it's a, yeah, I mean, web series, there's, there's about a billion of them now, but, um, yeah, even five years ago, really, it was it was kind of a rare thing. People didn't even really know what I was talking about when I'd say web series, uh, so I'd have to sort of explain it to them, and they always thought it was kind of a, kind of a misnomer and kind of a, yeah, kind of, kind of a unique thing that wouldn't last, but uh, it certainly has picked up, for sure. One of the exciting things about storytelling on the web is its well, its interactive nature, and and also how adaptable it is to to any kind of serial narrative. Yes, absolutely, and so so accessible and so easy to produce, and it sort of opens up a huge amount of different options for storytellers, and and people who could never tell stories in in traditional media can now tell their stories, which is great. Talking about telling stories, the next thing we want to talk about is what we have been playing lately on the show. I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Joanna again. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joanna, what have you been playing lately? Well, um, I'm always playing a lot of Pathfinder, for sure. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a staple of my life, <laughs> most All definitely. Right. Yeah. I actually, we've been sort of following a few of the, uh, of the Paizo adventure paths, um, just because they're really nicely written and, and they hold together very nicely. And, and I really want to start DMing my own game again. I haven't done it in a couple of years now, so I'd like to get back into it. And I want to go back and run Rise of the Rune Lords for a few friends of mine, just because it's such a beautiful story. It's such a great adventure path. I also just went to Godicon, which is a convention in Victoria, up Sweet. here in Canada, and uh, and I just tried a Dungeon World, which I was really excited about. Actually, I'd played Apocalypse World before, but Dungeon World just sort of takes the Apocalypse rules uh, and puts it in a fantasy setting, and and it was brilliant. So much fun. It probably had to do with the fact that I had a great DM, but I would love to try running something in there for sure. I've heard a lot of good things about Dungeon World. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was it was pretty fantastic. I've actually it's been good. I've I've tried out a lot of new games lately. I tried the uh the the new Star Wars RPG. Oh, I tried Edge of the Empire. Yes, Edge of the Empire, yeah. Yeah. I I worked on that game, so I'm I'm very pleased to hear that you like it. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean Fantasy Flight is is usually really reliable when it comes to good <laughs> gaming. So <laughs> You're making me a very years, happy man right now. Especially from the years two thousand eight to two thousand eleven, I believe. Uh, well, 
It, they, they, I, those guys continue to put out good, got, good content. Oh yeah. After after 2011, don't 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 listen to Daryl. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, but yes, yes, Edge of the Empire, awesome, yeah. exciting. I also Glad tried um, uh, Torchbearer as well. Um, oh yeah, another really interesting game. I mean, all these really cool games, the games that aren't Dungeons and Dragons are are hitting the mainstream, which is really nice to see. I tried Fate. Uh, I just bought Fiasco. I'm very very excited to try Fiasco as well. Cool. Yeah. That is a pretty long list. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Doesn't she really she needs short. to make up for me. So, <laughs> oh, <I see. laughs> so let's let's ask Elizabeth Bear what have what have you been playing lately? I am I am a sad, sad, sad creature lately. Actually, the only thing I've got going on regularly is my once a month uh, Pathfinder game uh, where I play the cleric because. <laughs> I, I, I'm that freak of nature who actually enjoys playing clerics. <laughs> me too, me too. Hey, Yay, they're really necessary. I'm not alone. <laughs> um, Sometimes it's nice playing the support character. Uh, it's, clerics it's, are really powerful in Pathfinder, actually. Yeah, so. I'm, I, I've, I've just gotten to a level where I've got like some of the really big offensive spells, and I killed the purple worm. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, the rest of the party spent three rounds hacking at it, but <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I got the flame steel. strike and cooked that <laughs> that bad boy. <laughs> nice. Got to feel very proud of myself. I'm, I'm sure they helped. <laughs> There's a dismissive hand gesture so that goes it with. It sounds like it sounds like you're starting to get to that level where it's like the cleric and the wizard, and then their helpers. Yeah. Well, we don't we well, don't actually have a have a dedicated wizard. Um, oh, that the, the, the magic know. users are a, are a, a barbarian wizard, a, a paladin, and me. Oh, and we've got an illusionist now. Um, oh, okay. Do those count, though? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> she's she's really she's really more like a rogue, you know, <laughs> more like a rogue who's who's extra tricky. A a good misdirection at the right time is worth. I mean, just ask Scott Lynch; he will tell you <laughs> <laughs> that a good misdirection at the right time is worth a, a, a gold mine. So, yeah, well, theoretically, he's he's been talking about putting together a, a Call of Cthulhu game or something, but apparently, he's got this book he needs to finish, or his <laughs> his, his fans are going to come to his house. So, <laughs> so all of you waiting for uh, uh, Gentleman Bastard Book Four will be pleased to note that he's not not actually running the the game that he promised his girlfriend he's he's writing you a book instead uh, <laughs> um, well i do we did bring up uh, fantasy flight just a little bit earlier yeah. and i should mention that during the time i was at fantasy flight uh there was a particular book that was making the rounds amongst all of the creative and designer types and uh not a day would go by without someone coming in and sticking their head in the room and saying dude have you guys read lies of lock lamora no really have you read Lies of Locke Lamore? So <laughs> well, you, you know where Scott uh, did should... his his writing apprenticeship. No, he was a an indie game designer for. for oh, really? Yeah, that's how he was making his living before he he sold Lies. Wow. Um, he worked on uh, I think it was Seventh Seal and on a bunch of on a bunch of indie titles. Interesting. Deeds not words. I'm sorry. I'm I'm. I'm a bad girlfriend. I can't rattle off all of his projects from 15 years ago <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> That's fine. It just I've, if you if you wouldn't mind letting him know, the guys at Fantasy Flight were all always bringing it up. So I thought I'd just mention he'll that. he'll be. Th I'll make him. I'll make him listen to the podcast. All right. I'll try to do it someplace where he'll be embarrassed. And uh, so, Daryl, uh, what have you been playing lately? Uh, the Shadowrun game everyone's been listening to, hopefully. I've been playing that. Um, <clears throat> by the time this airs, you will probably have heard me screw up big time. Yeah, I, I really helped out there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, aside from that, I am working on a secret project that I want to keep secret for the time being because it may show up on the podcast as well. Vague, but, vague pronunciations yes. is vague. Well, it's, most, it's, most, it's mostly because I don't want to announce it, and then I'm kind of stuck doing it, and my plate's a little full as it is. Understood. So, Well, um, I have also been playing the Shattering game uh, that we have now on our, our uh, game. It's called the Gamers Tavern Game Table. You can go yes. listen to it. And I've been uh, gearing up to play uh, the Avengers game, which is going to start, I think, next week, actually, which is going to be really cool. Uh, hmm. Avengers Next Generation with uh, me playing Valkyrie 2. 
the daughter of uh, Fandal the Dra- Fandal Fandral the Dashing and uh, Brunhilde the Valkyrie in Marvel's uh, the, sort of the 1980s Marvel universe. And uh, let's see, we've got uh, we we were playing Torg in my local group here, but we kind of gave up on Torg. And I, I know there's gonna be people <laughs> out there who are gonna hate me for saying this because. Uh, I have some very good friends who worked on Torg, but man, Torg is a really hard game to understand. <laughs> <laughs> I've played it four times, and I still am like, I just don't get this sometimes, man. Uh, but we gave it a really good shot, and we enjoyed it. We enjoyed it greatly, but... Uh, I'm having we, chivalry we, and sorcery post-traumatic stress disorder right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ultimately... We had Any to, game that involves calculus. <laughs> yeah. So, unfor- you know, alas, poor Torg. Oh. Uh, we knew you well. So that's that's what we've been playing lately. Um, new thing that we've been doing last few episodes, and we're trying to build it into a ongoing thing, is uh, what's called our Tavern Tales. And I'm just going to ask each of you ladies for a story about a very memorable die roll. And it doesn't have to be a die roll if you're playing a game that uses cards, for example, or even one of those <gasps> diceless RPGs. But if you don't mind giving us a story of a, of a memorable die roll... Uh, who would like to start? <laughs> Give me a minute. Ooh, I, 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 I've got one. Um, are, are, are we are we allowed to use uh, uh, adult language on this podcast? Fuck yes. yes. Okay, excellent. We my my gaming group uh, in in college generally referred to these as "No shit, there I was in a game of stories." Um, by that, you know the difference That's between a. Good- a Good name for it. Yes, you know the difference between a war story and a fairy tale, right? A fairy tale starts once upon a time, and a war story starts. No shit, there I was. <laughs> so, <laughs> no shit, there we were uh, in this ruined temple, uh, and I can't even remember what the heck we had been tracking down. It was a, a, a giant humanoid of so. This was. This was a game played when I was in college, so more than 20 years ago. But but some sort of, of more or less intelligent but not actually really smart giant humanoid had had beaten the uh the party one of the two party rangers down to near unconsciousness. Uh I think he had like two hit points left and was holding him up by the ankle basically saying, you know, surrender or the ranger gets it. Um the other ranger played by my friend Britt, uh, pulled out her longbow and said, eh, we never liked him anyway, and shot the ranger. <laughs> what wow. What the, the monstrous humanoid did not know was that uh, she had smeared her longbow arrow with uh, um, uh, Kyotam's ointment. So she did 1d6 points of damage and healed 2d6 by putting the shaft through him. And she rolled really crappy on her damage and really good for the healing. Um, <laughs> so she maxed out. The, she did like one point of damage and healed 12. And the nice. ogre or whatever the heck he was looked at the apparently now dead ranger in his hand and went, eh, and dropped him. <laughs> Came out to fight the rest of us and the ranger stabbed him in the back and killed him. That's nice. slick. That's slick. <laughs> it was the slickest. I had nothing to do with it, but it is one of the two slickest things I have ever seen in a D and D game. Okay, Joanna. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm sure there have been many, but one that really sticks in my mind. Actually, it was something that just happened recently. Um, I was over at, at this convention I was just mentioning earlier, uh, Godicon, and it was the first. It was the first convention where I was um, playtesting the new standard action Pathfinder module. So we have this Pathfinder module for standard action. That's the adventures of the team uh, between season one and season two. And cool. for the first time, I got to play test it, which was really exciting. Um, and the thing with standard action, for anybody who hasn't seen it before, um, the characters tend to be kind of gimpy, um, not in a good way. <laughs> so usually... Now, which character did you play? Um, well, I was DMing. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, we had, yeah, I had a, I had a party of four, so we had a Wendy so and a Fernando. So she played and, everyone. Uh, yeah, I played everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> and the game itself was written by a good friend of mine and a, a great game designer, Kevin Mickelson. And he 
he had written this uh, this encounter uh, where there was a bunch of kobolds, and the kobolds had, of course, set this incredibly intricate, beautiful trap. Incredible, like just just amazing, and um, and the team, of course, stumbled into it, and it's it's the kind of situation where like the characters themselves randomly through dice rolling get to express the kind of wacky, bizarre uh, nature that gets expressed in the web series. So our our sorcerer, um, Wendy, who in the web series is this sort of, uh, she, she's very concerned about the way she looks. She's very concerned about how, how the world sees her. She probably, ability score-wise, should not have been a sorceress. Um, she's tall and strong, and she probably should have been a rogue or a fighter or something. And it was great. This trap went off. She was flung through the air. She managed to, like, Gra- acrobatically grab some of the terrain swingers. It was like full on Indiana Jones. It was like natural 20s everywhere. She was leaping from log to tree to branch and swinging down and ended up slaughtering all of the kobolds where everybody else was struggling with their weapons and couldn't pull them out. And the, the one of them was trying to save the pony who was running away. And it was like, and then, and just Wendy just decided to just. Just completely beautiful. slaughter them all ninja wise, and it was incredible. It was it was that's beautifully awesome. done. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, that's exactly the kind of thing that happens in the show where it's like, um, really, sorcerer, really? <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's brilliant. Yeah, um, and, and you know, actually, what we're here to talk about tonight is when you know characters get to do awesome things, uh, but primarily, like what makes player characters fun to play in a role-playing game, as opposed to, say, a fun character in a work of fiction or... That's one thing that always popped immediately to my mind is you see so many characters that tried to do what basically pull the Wolverine, man with no name thing, where they're, I don't know my past, I'm mysterious, (laughs) you don't know who I am, and I'm just here to do my thing, and I do one thing really well, and it's not a nice (laughs) thing. (laughs) And that's... and that's all their character is, which those kind of characters can be really, really cool in fiction if they're written well. In a role-playing game, you are literally playing a block of stats, and that's it. Well, I think, I mean, let's be fair. The The idea of mystery as a trope, as something that you're going to, you know, sort of embrace with your character, it can work. I, You know, we're, we should be clear what we're saying here tonight is not going to be true for every group and every campaign. You know, so, sometimes that will work. I've, I've seen it happen where it worked. I mean, I know where I know where you're coming from. I know that you're saying, you know, typically what what happens is that's pretty much all they they want to do with it, and it doesn't go any further. I mean, I understand where that comes from. Well, there, there's a problem that can that can happen where the specific gravity of characters like that is that often they're they're better as NPCs or as as secondary characters than as protagonists or player characters, especially if you have a player who has created a character who is all about the mysterious backstory. Often there's gonna, they, they are going to have this expectation, and I'm sorry, I'm talking more game mastering than, than character design here. Often that, that player is gonna have the expectation that a large part of the plot is gonna be about their character's mysterious backstory. And I think there's a, I've, I've seen GMs assign characters, quote, mysterious backstories or, or deep dark secrets that they don't know about. And I think that works much better than when the player decides, ooh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I have a mysterious backstory because Wolverine doesn't know his backstory, at least not at the beginning. And I think that makes him more interesting. It makes him more playable in my mind than if he had decided, if he were a player character and he had decided all this stuff and then the game became about the other players, you know, discovering it. Cause that's not interesting for the other players. Well, there, there's some new modern games like Fate, I think, that are it's sort of embracing the idea of sort of empowering the player to tell his own story. Yeah. Uh, if you if you had an aspect called Mysterious, for example, in a Fate game, Joanna, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, couldn't you sort of leverage that to actually, you know, add some coolness to the game? Sure, absolutely. I think the difference um, between sort of what, what we're talking about with sort of the 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 player who's created a character with a mysterious past um, that sits on, you know, 10 sheets of paper attached to the back of their character sheet. <laughs> the problem with that is that it sometimes doesn't apply 
when yeah, you, a different agenda. It's like, yeah, it's like a player has a different agenda than everybody else. Sure. Yes. Or or it it doesn't actually ever come into play in the present. And the thing with having an aspect like mysterious in a fake game is that you can use it in the current situation for a particular reason, which is great because that means that that aspect that you've th- you've thought a lot about and that you want to be a part of your character actually applies to the story right now, rather than waiting with all of that information which may never be seen right you're, and you're it may giving... never actually affect how your character reacts to other characters which is really the only thing that matters when you're playing a game with other people yes and you're you're giving uh your your game master and or the other players a hook into your character as opposed to creating this this little frictionless sphere around your character that nobody else can get into and interact with it's yeah. like you know, if if you give your character backstory enemies, then you have to expect the the GM to use them to advance the plot. They no longer belong just to your character. So, if I understand what you're saying correctly, you're you're, you're basically saying that because gaming is social, yes, uh, uh, to to be a good player means that if you're going to use a trope like something like mysterious, it needs to work in a way that doesn't uh, interfere with the other players having fun. Yes, yes, I've I've, I've seen players create a deep, mysterious backstory and then try to exclude everyone else from it. And yep. that, that always <laughs> yes. winds up being, okay, this character is off in the corner doing their own thing. Yeah, and then there's a game going themselves. on in the rest of the room. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and as the game master, you still have to go over there and, and play with that person, but it becomes a very interrupted... It, it's almost like you're running a separate game for that person who... who yeah wants it, it's got a gravity it, it it either bends the game around it or the game moves off in a different direction so this is really a, a player issue not so much a character issue well I, I think it I think it's I think it's character issue in that any player any inexperienced player can make that mistake sure I mean they can stumble into it absolutely can write somebody who would be a good fictional character would be a brilliant fictional character but is not a great game character because part of making a really strong Game character is, is, is hooks, is narrative hooks, is giving places, creating places for the story to stick to your character. Right. We actually have a guy on our podcast uh, who came on a while back, Daryl Hardy. His term for that is called engagement anchors. Mm. I just call them hooks. Which, which I thought was a great name yes. <laughs> for it. He uh, has all these little awesome names for all these plot right. devices in game <laughs> design, man. It's awesome. Yeah, and I think I think you're absolutely right, yeah. Elizabeth. I think that is uh, plot, plot felt that is something you should do. Now that you brought up a really interesting point that I wanted to explore a little more, as you said, this is what you know separates a good RPG character from a good fiction character. Could I ask both of you to expand on that a little bit? What are some other ways you you know that you can differentiate between a good fiction character and a good RPG character? Well, I think scale for sure. I mean, like I was saying before, an RPG character or a character that you're designing to be in a social game playing with other people, I find as a player if I'm designing one for myself that there really can only be sort of a handful of very specific character traits or choices or you know story ideas that I'm going to assign to that character so that I can use them in the game in sort of a, a vital, visceral way, and I can interact with people on these different levels. Like maybe I've got three things that I really want, or I've got uh, one one really strong relationship that I can hold on to and go back to whenever I need guidance in my character. Whereas designing a character for sort of a larger narrative, um, there can be so much more. There can be so much detail. There can be so much depth that you can pack into it. And really, you could do that with an RPG character. You could. But I would say that it's probably not worth your while. I think you should probably focus on a few small, or I would focus on a handful of specific choices and then allow the game to develop the detail in the rest of it rather than coming in with all that detail present. So start out with just a handful of defining traits. Yeah, I would say. For sure. I mean, that's what I would do. It sounds very reasonable to me. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with that almost completely because I think part of what makes role-playing work is that game is a, is an emergent property of, of everybody's creative process. You know, you're, you're all coming in with your ideas and then you, you sort of splash them together and they get changed and altered. One of the, one of the coolest things we, we ever did in terms of character creation was I ran, a, speaking of diceless role-playing games, I ran an Amber game low these many years ago. And one of the weird little mechanical things about the Amber diceless role-playing system 
is that characters get their stats in in an auction. Everybody has a certain number of points to spend, and then they bid against each other hmm. to create rankings. So, so basically, how good you are at something is defined by who you're better or worse than. And this is intended in the game mechanic to create rivalries between the characters who are supposed to be part of a large dysfunctional family. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's actually a pretty clever way to do that. And, and what I did with these particular characters who were after a fashion supposed to be growing up together is I had everybody get together and role play, just role play situations like a poker game, you know, that a, a dinner party, non-combat situations, you know, non-plot situations, just to get a sense of what everybody's relationships were and who their friends were and who their enemies were before I ran the auction. And it was really interesting because it turned out that there were people who were willing to work together on stuff to like corner the market on things. And then there were other people who just, their characters hated each other and they got into these <laughs> horrible bidding wars. <laughs> Nice and see, so that that creates more more dimension to every one of those characters in that situation. Yeah, that they and, didn't necessarily come into the room with exactly, and it was in, because of the interactivity, the the emergent property of that. So basically, an illustrative example of exactly the thing you were just describing. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Actually, that's going to take us into I think a uh, slightly like separate topic because. I was going to ask you about some ways to define your character in your in an RPG without going back to just mechanics. And what's, what Elizabeth just uh, described is actually a really good way to do that. Now, there have been many games that have tried to include sort of a, uh, a guide for how to do this outside of your mechanics to define your character. Daryl, do you want to list off some of your favorites? One that I miss sorely, because I don't believe it is in... Fourth edition. I know it's not in fifth edition. I'm pretty sure it was not in fourth edition. But in first, second, and third edition, Shadowrun, there was the twenty questions, and it was twenty questions about your character and their history, and it was just a perfect list of twenty characters. I, would, I use this in, when I'm writing fiction. It's so perfect to come up with backstories because just asks, what about family? What about job? What was your first job? And how? And all just all these great questions, and. It's not in the current editions, and it's not available online anywhere, legally at least. So I, it's a shame that it's kind of gone, because it was just a great tool for developing that sort of backstory. Yeah, it, it did make you think about your character, you know, in terms of things other than just his, you know, how strong he was or how many dice he had to shoot things with. Yeah. Which is always good. <laughs> I, I know a lot of GMs like to basically ask for at least a paragraph of backstory. Uh, that's at least been in my experience. Or if you're like me, you write a, five, a three or four thousand word short story, <laughs> which, I which is on the website, at, yes. which is on the website at gamerstavern.org. If anyone's curious, <laughs> I love writing backstories. I, I usually end up writing significant backstories for my characters for sure. I think it's just because I really want to get to know them. I think some people, and maybe maybe me sometimes as well, fall into the trap of, of writing too much for sure. And none of it ever really pops up, or it ends up changing, or I decide that something else would be more interesting along the way. But I, I do love writing backstories, for sure. I'm, I'll have to check out that chat around 20 questions. I, I don't think I've ever seen that. Yeah, well, it was a classic back in the day, although I'm going to go to something I think was far more extensive. And actually, uh, one of my favorite products that I have on my shelf is the Central Casting Books. Are you guys familiar with these? No. These books were made by... Uh, uh, Paul slash Janelle Jacques back in the day. Uh, they were called Heroes of Legend was the original one. And then there was Heroes of Today and then Heroes of Tomorrow. And these were basically really big charts of things you could either roll or choose to determine your character's birth and history and like where he learned his, his, uh, his abilities and things like that. And they were... They were wonderful idea generators. Uh, you could just sit down and, and, if you wanted to, just roll randomly to get surprised, or you could kind of guide yourself, say, okay, I, I know I want to be a street samurai eventually, so I'm going to say here I, I learned to be a street samurai. That kind of stuff. I I think there's a there's a com I mean, sometimes you get that wonderful synchronicity of, of something that you take for points, you know, like a disad or something blossoming into a wonderful character trait, uh, sometimes for, for other characters in the game. And there was a, a vampire LARP I was in where one of the other characters had taken so many levels in, in despised and hunted that, that the game master gave every other character in the game some reason to hate this guy. 
And he was dead by the end of the first session. Wow. <laughs> Didn't work out so well for him, but we formed a lot of alliances around it. Um, wow. <laughs> No, that is awesome. Everybody else got a lot of backstory out of his diss ad. So, <laughs> you know, stuff like that is a lot that 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 is a lot of fun. Also, what I find is often most interesting is the backstory that's not sort of immediately game related, like, you know, not necessarily where you learned your skills or or who your teachers were, but who 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 your first who your character's first love affair was with or you know what their what their internal contradictions are because often you you find these characters who are less fun to play after a while you figure out that it's because they're sort of one or two dimensional you know the the stereotypical paladin who who walk you know sleeps in his armor um, <laughs> <laughs> and has never made a bad decision those guys aren't very much fun to play long term they become like one note gag characters after a while so I, I really like contradictions. I like thing, unexpected things and surprising things in my characters. Uh, one game that uh, that did some some interesting stuff with character development and uh, and the kind of thing that the sort of contradictory choices and secrets and decisions and relationships that I tried about a year ago uh, was Burning Wheel. Right. Burning Wheel did some really interesting things with that where. It had a lot to do with uh, your goals and your motivations and the motivations that you didn't tell anyone and the relationships that you had with different people and what you told people and what you didn't tell people and the secrets that you had. The system itself, I'm not entirely convinced uh, by it. I tried it a couple times and I think I need to try it again just because I think, I don't know, I didn't, didn't, didn't quite get into it. But the character development I thought was really interesting. And again, coming back to, to fate, one of the interesting things about fate was the fact that the relationships that you defined with the other people at the table, which was the basically the main part of the character development, uh, a lot of it was defined by other people at the table. So you actually would pass your character sheet over to someone else. And they would help you define your relationship with them, which was very interesting, for sure. So not only are you bringing your own ideas in, but you're working with everybody else directly. It's not just sort of an indirect social, okay, if I bring my character into the room with you, what will happen? No, no, they actually are helping you define your character, which... Uh, uh, yep, Fiasco has something really similar as well. Whenever you're setting up your scenario, you set up every character has a relationship to the character on the left and right. you have to have a relationship with at least two other characters in every fiasco game right yeah. right yeah so. yeah it's 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 a really neat idea now yeah. joanna i would recommend for you if you haven't tried mouse guard mouse guard is a very simplified version of the burning wheel engine and uh, i find it to be uh, very compelling as, as a way to like kind of explore that it's funny that the friend of mine who who was so diehard about Burning Wheel and who we tried Burning Wheel with is now so diehard about Mouse Guard. So he's <laughs> he's telling me he's like you got to do this. So he's he's forwarded me all the information. So yes, I will I will get there next for sure. I'm very keen on that idea of un unless you are intentionally running a you know characters walk into a bar and notice the the blue glow of player characterhood around one another uh, <laughs> kind of scenario Yay. oh he's got a little exclamation point over his head i guess i'll go talk to him <laughs> you look trustworthy <laughs> <laughs> you have the blue player oh. <laughs> you can play for laughs with the whole uh, you look trustworthy thing i've done it yes. before oh, know, yeah. just because it's, it's hilarious but it yeah. is yes let me buy you a drink you look like a player character um <laughs> The uh, is that idea of, of having the characters have some sort of relationship with one another. The very old, like uh, West End Star Wars, had a, had one particular metric for this that I loved, where if you were playing a Wookiee character, yes, you, you yes, automatically got one character, one other character who spoke Wookiee for free. Yep, which I loved. I thought that <laughs> so, was great. so there was somebody in the group you could talk to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it worked out well because you you this was this was back when Star Wars uh, not everybody spoke in uh, uh, stereotypical uh, accents. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it was that that was the D ten <laughs> Star Wars, right? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. Back in the dim mists of history, mm. in the dark days before the <laughs> yeah, Empire. It's a fantastic <laughs> game. I never played it, but it is a really fantastic game. But I, what I think is really interesting is we've all kind of drifted towards talking about relationships between player characters as a way to sort of define them. And I think that's a really wonderful topic to to kind of that's, dip into. 
That's kind of what you and I did, Ross. Oh, it's totally. It's, it's totally true. Like when we made our, our Shadowrun characters, part of the reason that we had so much fun with them is because we built them as the odd couple to start with. Yeah, R- Ross had this great idea to make the, uh, and again, using his flaws, he has distinctive style Shadowrunner. He Stereotypical a, Shadowrunner. Stere- yeah, he is a pixie. <laughs> he, he, he is a pixie who has learned everything he knows about Shadowrunning from uh, Trids and media and Basically watching TV movies and, the internet. and Simpsons. And so that's all he knows. So that's what he thinks it's supposed to be like all the time. So he will actually in character ask himself, what would Curl Combat Mage do right now? Oh, God. I, your, your pixie. So it's like, it's like imagining police work is like a diehard movie. Right. Your pixie much. is trying too hard. <laughs> yes. And when he described this character to me, it was just like, that is so perfect. But there's one thing missing. You need a foil. You need a straight man. So I made the guy who worked security for a corporation who just happened to get laid off recently. He's really professional really buy the books <laughs> and so we've been playing off each other oh that's beautiful it's sorry our inspiration was the uh dragnet dragnet movie starring dan Aykroyd and tom hanks hmm. so he's dan Aykroyd, and i'm tom hanks in that case. <laughs> what i think is really interesting is actually we, we we started out by kind of going on like what are some games that provide you with um a guide towards building your character outside of the mechanics. And then we started talking about relationships. And the very next two things I wanted to bring up are both game systems that encourage gamers to build relationships between their characters. The first one is one I actually designed for uh, Rogue Trader. It was called The Origin Path. Uh, is anyone here familiar with the Rogue Trader uh, Origin Path? No. I am not. I'm sorry. It's okay. We have uh, failed you, Ross! <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Basically, we were trying to because because Rogue Trader is about you know a bunch of really powerful people on a ship, you know exploring the great unknown. And one of our big inspirations, obviously, was Firefly. Mm-hmm. And we looked at Firefly and we said, well, each of these characters you can draw a connect a direct link to some other character. Zoe and 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 Mal fought in the war together. You know, Zoe and Wash are married. There's always some connection. So we we designed the origin path to where when you made your character, you would choose certain things on on these columns and then draw a line to connect those those selections. And all the characters would do this, and you'd find the intersection points. And those intersection points would be the the places where you and another character had done something together. Hmm. So we were trying to build in. You know, couldn't, of course, couldn't guarantee it, but we tried to build in, you know, a, a style where you would end up on a spaceship with people that you, you know, they all had some kind of history that they'd shared. Smallville and some of the other Cortex games has a really interesting way of drawing uh, connections between characters as well, where they will sort of design NPCs for each other and then link them to, you know, like a, a villain or a shared loved one or things of that nature, uh, which I think is really interesting as well. Those are both kind of formalized ways to do things that, that various gaming groups I've been in have done very informally. I played an awful, played in and game mastered an awful lot of third edition Call of Cthulhu back in the day. One of the things about Call of Cthulhu in any edition is that the character attrition rate tends to be pretty high. You know, any game that uh, defines itself by its its seven minute character generation process probably is compensating for something. <laughs> so we we came up with a, a number of hacks for getting p- new players, new well, new characters by the same players more often into the game. One of the one of the the brilliant ones, if you didn't didn't squint too closely, was the idea that all of these people were employees of a, a multinational insurance corporation, and they all worked in the fraud squad. Um, nice, <laughs> which is also nice because you if, if you don't have the same people can have multiple characters if they like, and uh, if you don't have the same players from week to week, then you just run it as an episodic game and bring in different you know whatever players you happen to have. Each one brings in a character. And the, the other good hack for that is the large academic setting. Like, these are all people who are somehow affiliated with a university or um, a Starfleet or whatever it is that you happen to have that is suitable to your uh, setting. Right. And also that, I mean, the other thing that we used to do is everybody would write up some sort of a rough character backstory and then we'd look for points of congruence. Like, oh, we both have advanced degrees, maybe we went to college together. It is nice. always wonderful when it works organically like yeah. that. I agree. And I think 
this is one of the reasons why when I GM, I really prefer to get everybody together to do character generation together rather than kind of individually on your own. Yeah, it, gamers that have been together for a long time or game together for a long time or, or DMs that know the characters or the players really well, oftentimes it does happen organically. I've been playing with a group starting D&D 3.5 and then Pathfinder for years and years and years. And it tends to just happen when we create characters we want to create relationships between between us because it gives us something to play with. When you walk into a game where you don't know the, the other player, sometimes it can be a bit a bit more challenging. And so it's, sometimes it's kind of nice to have a little bit of a structure built into the game or a, or a guidance from the DM. The DM sits down with you the day before when you build your characters and you figure out exactly how you're going to make it work. I mean, it, it makes storytelling easier for the GM anyway if you've got... Yeah. Uh, if you've got that sort of history and structure. And so you don't have to worry about, yeah, the cold walking into a tavern. Um, mm-hmm. Describe the way you look character. It's like, ugh, it's, it's, it's hard. I look like a player character. <laughs> Buy me a beer. <laughs> yeah. I have better Invite than average equipment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, in my group, uh, we had a lot of indecisive people. And, and, and I noticed that the, uh, the organic growth usually happened when somebody took the initiative. Uh, for example, we were all creating characters for a fantasy hero game, and my friend Steve was the first one to say, okay, I know what I'm playing. I am playing a nobleman, a knight, who is on his first quest. And the very next post in the email was someone saying, I am playing now playing your court wizard. <laughs> nice. Very nice. And it, just, and it just grew from there because... Well, you know, they'd already said it, so <laughs> uh, the the indecisive guys suddenly had, you know, more context uh, mm-hmm. for their characters, and it, and it just kind of grew out of that. I wonder if that may be something that people could look at more in the future and, and sort of see their character creation in, in the context of relationships rather than in the context of the individual strengths and weaknesses that, that they have uh, you know, come to the table sort of with a preconception of. Yes. Yeah, I'm, us- oh. I'm usually the indecisive guy because that and that ends up why I end up playing a lot of deckers, a lot of street samurais, and a lot of clerics. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm the last guy to make my character, but I like playing those sort of support role characters. And if I am the last one, I'm kind of filling in the gaps in the team or the party. That gives me an opening. Okay, this is what everyone else is playing. I can assume based on general tropes, this is typically the kind of thing they're going to play unless they've already introduced the character and it gives me jumping off points to say okay what can i make that's going to interact with all these other personalities in an interesting way that's also not going to be disruptive either so you're you're building your character with the context of how do i fit into this group exactly yeah. and that's yeah. a good way to to i think that's a good way to sort of build that organic relationships that we were just talking about yeah, I do kind of like the indecisive people, to be honest, because the people that, the people that come in with this, like, because I, I mean, I know several people, gamers that I game regularly with who are like this, who will spend all of their free time building a character, like just just going through all of the different feet structures and tables and skills and how they can balance things and how they can min-max themselves and and creating these characters that are like, this, this is what I'm going to play. This is going to be amazing. And then they come into the group and they have absolutely no context where they're like, this is what I'm going to play. And then you look at the rest of the group and you're like, well, I guess that doesn't really fit anyone else, but this is what I'm going to play because I've been planning this for years. And those, those are the people who are, who can be a little bit challenging. Oftentimes they're really hardcore gamers. So it's fun to play with them because they're really into it. But it is nice every once in a while to have a few people in the group that are a little more undec- indecisive who, who say, yeah, inspire me, players. Inspire me, rest of my group. What should I do? Like, what, 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 what would fit well? It's You're nice talking about a wide, like a wide focus as opposed to a narrow focus. Yeah, or just being open and receptive to, uh, yeah. to what's being given to you. Maybe a, maybe a slightly more improvisational style. Sure. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say an evolving concept as opposed to one that's sort of set in stone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's that's something that uh, that game masters can actually do to help their players with character creation is is give them as much information about context as possible. Because if you tell me, oh, it's a fantasy hero game, I go to, you know, just sort of automatically generic interminable quest fantasy. Um <laughs> And, well, fantasy uh, hero is a is a generic interminable uh, quest fantasy, but but yeah, it's, it's exactly. It's, well, so it's system wise, yes, it doesn't actually have a setting per se. Ex- well, exactly. So, but if you if you tell me we're playing fantasy hero, 
I'm assuming generic European fan, you know, extruded fantasy product is the setting. Right. But if you tell me, oh, it's going to be, you know, my my setting is going to be based on 16th century Germany, that I'm starting to think about some interesting stuff like the socio political system and and who might be there as opposed to okay, well we've got you know knights and squires and wizards. We've got merchants, maybe, or you know, there's there's a whole there's a whole context there that suddenly becomes much more inspirational and gives me things to work with as a player, it gives me foundation stones to build my character on. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, my friend Stephen Ferlani ran a game a while back where he said we're going to run it and it's going to be like like Celtic legends, like you know King Arthur or early King Arthur type stuff. And so you know, most of the party showed up with characters who were like bards and druids and you know. You know, knights, things like that nature, and that, and that's what that's what we were thinking. In, you know, when we came to the table because of his description. Yeah. So we've talked about like the relationships thing, and I think that's a that is a just fantastic thing. And I'm glad we brought it up. But let's let's actually expand that out a little bit. Let's ask the question: What makes a character fun to play? Well, before we do that, you might want to take a little quick break to get another drink. Hi, this is Rich and Amanda for Animation Celebration. We have a great show going on March 28th through 30th at the Hilton Garden Inn in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Come meet Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman, and Steve Cardenas, the Red Power Ranger. We have exclusive VIP ticket for dinner with Kevin Conroy. Come meet your favorite voice actor in person. We have a lot of other great guests coming, like Matt Hill, Raphael from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Big Ed from Ed, Ed, and Eddie. We've got actors from everything from Disney shows to My Little Pony. Check out the area Ghostbusters and more. Tickets are available online right now at www.animation-celebration.com. We even have a big Lebowski night. We look forward to seeing you all there. So the, the question we need to ask now is what makes a character fun to play? Well, I think it's, for me, a character is fun to play when it's something that, because again, role-playing is very, very interactive. It's a social game. It, you have to have a character that fits in with the group, but also has a little bit of, I, I ran a game in 4th edition D&D for about seven or eight months, where everyone got along all the time. Everyone was on the same page. No <laughs> arguments whatsoever. We And looking back on it, I'm, I was wondering why I kept getting burned out so frequently. And I realized what it was. is I wasn't playing a role-playing game. It didn't seem like I was playing a miniature combat game that happened to have a plot. Because there, the characters just... There was no tension. Everyone was always on the same page. No one had different approaches to anything. Well, I'm actually and, okay with that in most <laughs> cases. But <laughs> Well, I mean, the crew on the Firefly, they bickered all the time. Whenever whenever Reavers were coming, everyone was on the same page and all fighting. But that, the character interactions were what that made that show great. Same thing with if you go to Buffy. Well, all I'm saying is people who are always on the same side doesn't necessarily mean bland. I don't mean necessarily on the same side. I mean, like, literally the same page. Like, no one even questioned tactics. Like, what should, what should we do to go fight evil so-and-so? We should do this. Yes, I, I agree. I had that same idea. I, I'm, so I, there was that sounds, any character interaction. I'm actually fine with that. I, there's, there's times I've really enjoyed games where there was none of that, honestly. So, I, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to be on the opposite side of that and say I, I, teamwork is good for me. I like teamwork. T- teamwork is a very, very good thing. But I, I like having character. the characters interact with each other. What it was is they never really interacted with each other. They all interacted with me and the NPCs. Okay, well, that's see, that's different than, than yeah. not having any, any party tension. That just means they weren't <laughs> really role-playing. <laughs> yeah, sort of sounds like it, really. <laughs> I don't know. I... I really love playing characters with significant or at least apparent uh, weaknesses. It doesn't even have to be like a stat weakness. Like it doesn't have to be, oh yeah, I took uh, intelligence as my dump stat. No, it doesn't have to be anything like that. It can be just some like specific thing that, that they either do they do badly or they have a very strong choice about which may not be logical or reasonable uh, and they can use that or if I'm playing the character I can use that to uh, to really define how I sit in any particular situation uh, and oftentimes strong choices like that like me making a strong choice that my character is racist 
against somebody means that interesting conversations are going to come up. And I really enjoy those interesting conversations. I do have to say that I really do enjoy inter-party conflict, not to the point where it slows the game down or breaks the game, because I've been in situations like that, where somebody's just like, nope, I'm not going to go with you. And then that just breaks everything. But actually having conflicting opinions within a party, I find to be really stimulating. And I really like that quite a bit. And oftentimes that comes up when players decide to make strong choices about their characters one way or another. Just just making a choice and sticking with it will oftentimes generate some interesting uh, character development and, and discussions and interactions. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that go both ways. Um, games that were broken because the, the characters had radically different ideas of what to do and, and things just sort of fell apart into party conflict. But also games where... The, uh, I, I've actually found that, that there's a thing where sometimes you'll get like the one guy who just either never seems to agree with anybody else or always manages to somehow screw up the plan. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and and being disagreeable just to be disagreeable. Well, no, because the, the, the guy who acts as a spoiler, yes. intentionally acts as a spoiler constantly is really kind of wear, wearing to be around. One of the things that's kind of fun is if you have somebody who is who's not the player isn't obstructionist, if you know what I mean. I'm making a distinction between between player and character here, but in sometimes the maybe the character is just a little inept or can't follow directions or mm-hmm. is a little impulsive. Is a little and impulsive. Commanding voice while hiding. Yes. 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 Or you know we're all going <laughs> to hang back and ambush them when they come around the corner, and the cavalier decides that it would be a great idea to go running down and, and engage them immediately. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know that guy can, interest. <laughs> can yeah that guy can actually be kind of a lot of fun to play with because if nothing else you could bitch about him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what what we've all kind of been talking about is uh, talking about the idea of a character that is defined by their flaws more than by their strengths, or at least has some. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and that's what makes the character fun to play. Yes, absolutely. Is because sometimes I mean, it, well, let's be let's be clear. It is always fun to play with a character who's got some strengths, but it's also really fun in in a dif- different way to play a character who has a distinctive weakness or blind spot or flaw or however you wish to say it. Mm-hmm. Until it merges over into caricature, I think because that that can sort of you know that thing can become a crutch. I would say it depends on the tone, though. Yes, I mean, if your tone. It, if you're doing like a four color superhero game, there's no reason why it couldn't be caricature. Yeah, but boy, if I never see another dwarf who hates elves again, I'll be, <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> yeah, we get Let it. Let me tell you about this uh, character I'm playing. It's a dark elf, but he's not like any other dark elf. <laughs> he's actually good. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, what what yeah, a two swords. Hey, uh, one of my one of my cats. favorite player characters ever was a was a dark elf. And the, the the hook with her was that she had been exiled from, you know, the underworld kingdom because of her alignment and got up to the surface and discovered that, you know, maybe at best she was really chaotic neutral. <laughs> <laughs> but wow. she was just so much better than everybody else. That <laughs> I'm not actively evil. I just don't really care. <laughs> I'm not a sociopathic sadist. Yeah, I'm just a little <laughs> self-centered. <laughs> Speaking of caricature, though, I mean, sometimes I find that there are some players who who might not be like you know. I play with a lot of actors, and actors are they love character, and they're like, oh yeah, this is all about the role play. They don't even care about the game; they just want to play the character. And then, of course, you play with other gamers who are might maybe not quite as comfortable role playing, maybe not quite as comfortable developing a character, speaking in character, acting as their character. And sometimes those sort of big stereotypical choices uh, for a character, like I'm a dwarf who hates elves, sometimes actually they start by using it as a crutch and it starts as a caricature and then sometimes it grows into something else. So I would even, I would even say, you know, don't worry so much about things that maybe at first glance look like they're stereotypical because really you can often grow with them. I mean, we're talking about 
bringing a character into a party and allowing the party to influence who you are and what you do, well, you know, sometimes that happens, even with the most generic of um, sort of <laughs> generated flaws that you decide to come up with. Well, you know what I think is also really interesting is, especially if you're a gamer who's been a, been around for a long time, it, what's really interesting is sometimes to actually sit down and make a list of your, your favorite characters and just kind of define them however you want. Just But, but make a list and start finding out, like, what is in common between all of those. Something I've noticed over gaming over 28 years now good lord Mm. um over 28 years of gaming is that you can tell a lot about people from the types of characters they play i have a good friend of mine named uh josh dowdell and josh is a great great guy he's he's a wonderful person he's actually a straight arrow you know works for the government uh you know never done anything wrong in his life but every single role-playing game character he's ever made has been (laughs) a rebel against authority who will just buck this system at every turn you know and i find that i find that fascinating i just and recently i did it to myself I, i looked at all the characters that i found the most memorable and looked for common traits and it turns out, apparently, and, and I haven't analyzed it any further than this, but it turns out I love playing naive characters uh, or very inexperienced characters or characters who are just – are not graspers of, like, the common culture. Hmm. Uh, Rafe being a good example of that. And I don't know what that says about me, but it's it's interesting. A lot of people like to play characters that are not what they are. Uh, I am a very tall, overweight guy. I like playing thin, agile, elfy type characters. Graceful and beautiful and Legolas, Legolas like <laughs> jumping across, walking across the snow and not leaving a trace. Because it's kind of fantasy wish fulfillment. Well, we are talking and, about escapism here. Really. I was about to say, I really like to play very and competent people, so I'm not sure I like where this is going. I, you, you I was going to say the same thing. All my characters are very hyper competent in their area. Uh, Kyle Rogers, my character in the Shadowrun game, he is a bodyguard. He has an ethos. And this goes back to the what you were saying about uh, flaws. Shadowrun has a disadvantage system, or, or uh, ne- they're called negative qualities in 4th edition. And the way I have made my character, I gave him negative flaws I didn't get points for because they were part of the character. He's got an obsession with finding someone that he failed to protect. She got kidnapped. So he's trying to track them down, and uh, and that I could have gotten points for. I didn't. Well, but I probably should have. But... <laughs> All I'm saying is, uh, but, you know, this this I think it's, it help it's helpful sometimes to sort of realize if you have a pattern, just because it can be really interesting to try playing outside of that pattern. A good example is playing at a convention game where there's pre-generated characters. Um, I've often been surprised by how much I've enjoyed playing something that I would have never created, as an example. This just, just kind of goes back to the idea of how to make a fun character. Well, sometimes a fun character is actually something that you wouldn't have thought of or that you wouldn't have made given your own choice. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, no, I, I agree, actually. I think I usually, when I'm left to my own devices, I will usually create chaotic characters, usually. And I remember playing this game. It was a... It was an Iron Kingdoms game, but it wasn't in the new Iron Kingdoms system. It was back when Iron Kingdoms was um, a setting, and it was played in 3.5. I love the Iron Kingdoms setting. I love the story and the world. It's probably still my favorite setting. Um, And I played a cleric of Menoth, and Menoth is like... (laughs) He's all about order. Order, really, really. And to the point where, like, really rejecting everybody else and and very very intolerant um, my way or the highway exactly and i had a lot of fun playing that cleric um and totally different gaming experience uh but a lot of fun for sure so yeah i mean i think i think we all sort of notice after a while the kind of characters that we generally find easy to play and find a lot of fun to play and it is kind of neat to sit down and try something different so how are some ways that you can sort of take this character that you've found to be fun, you know, the, the things that you've identified that you really think are fun, and how do you evolve those in a way that are separate from, say, the growth of your stats or the growth of your mechanical, you know, interface with the game? I always like to give my characters some goal that doesn't have anything to do with stats. Like, uh, for example, Kyle in the Shadowrun game is trying to find the person he couldn't protect. 
the one that went missing. He's trying to track her down. It gives him something to do, and, and it gives him some closure on this part of his life. And that, that's a little bit of a story element. They can go to, you can come up with pretty much anything along those lines that's just something that character wants or needs, but doesn't and has to achieve, whether it's a flaw he needs to overcome or, like, overconfidence or uh, bravado, uh, acting in, impulsively. Or it can be an actual story idea, like finding something, getting something back. And it gives you something to shoot for. It gives you a little bit of a story arc. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I agree to a certain extent. Um, I think that in order to try to keep it um, sort of nestled within the game, uh, whenever I create a character, um, I think about that thing, that element, that out of, uh, not related to stats, the element in the character that isn't related to stats, as why they're here. I often find that um, to be useful to think about why they left home, if they were at home before, why they're with this group of people. Because if I think about that and I make it a really strong choice then I uh, use that to play against all the other characters. One thing that I have found that in the past, sometimes when I've tried to make a really strong choice for a character, like, you know, to to give your example, I'm looking for somebody that, that I've lost. It's useful as long as you don't let it overtake the story that you're in right now, and you let it you let it inspire you. It's it's even better if you can talk to the GM about it and get them to maybe play it into their story a little bit, for sure. But oftentimes, I, I just do the, the straight up, why am I here situation. And if I can think of a really strong choice as to why I'm here, that'll often influence uh, other things that I do. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's that plot Velcro thing again, is providing places for the plot to stick to you. In, in terms of character development and what makes a character interesting, for me, there's there's sort of two things, and they're the same things that that make a good, interesting protagonist when I'm when I'm writing fiction. One is that for me, and and Daryl already said this, but I want to reinforce it: the character absolutely has to want something. Kurt Vonnegut, you know, said of of writing characters that make make them want something, even if it's only a glass of water, like, <laughs> you know. That's like Joseph Campbell too. Wants versus yeah, needs. exactly. And and well, and and you have to want something. And then if you need something that's different from what you want, that's beautiful because that's instantly a tension point. Then you're Rick Blaine in Casablanca, who wants to be left alone, but really needs to reclaim himself and get back into the fight. You just name checked my favorite movie. Of all time. <laughs> um, good, ch- excellent choice. And the the other thing is. Oddly enough, you can say the same thing about Jack Burton in Big Trouble Little China, <laughs> he, um, which is my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> all he wants to do is be left alone. The Bruce, yeah, the Bruce Willis character in, in Die Hard doesn't actually want to be left alone, but he just wants to talk to his soon-to-be ex-wife and maybe talk her into not leaving him. <laughs> yeah. Well, J- Jack, and also Jack Burton wanted his truck. Yes, back. yes, that's well, a, that that's a secondary motivation. On, yeah. That's an evolved motivation. But I also like to phrase the thing that drives a character is they have issues and agendas. And, and by issues, I mean like, like hot buttons, trigger points, things that will get them moving. If you install one of those in a character, I had a character who would always, always, always go to the, the help of a, another woman in distress. This was just a thing she would do. She couldn't walk away from that. And my God, the GM made my life a living hell. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here's a plot. Well, I'm hook. just picturing like every single hardball detective. Ever. Exactly. You know, can't can't resist a dame. So you know, I say issues and agendas. So if you've got an issue, you've got some sort of a the character Jenny Casey in in my my hammered books can't resist a kid in trouble. She just can't do it, and I used that to screw her over repeatedly. Um, <laughs> the, the players uh, appreciate that. I mean, they yes. love it when you take that thing that, that makes them special and different and use it. I, I, I love doing it as a GM, and I love it when GMs do it for me. Yeah. Another great one is character who can't, very seducible character. The char- you know, the character who can't, and doesn't necessarily have to be sexual, but the, the character who just can't say no to an appropriately phrased entreaty. They're really, <laughs> you, you can do so much with them as a game master. Um, yeah. and, and there might be treasure. There in might that be treasure place. in that. You know, I really need your help. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is giving them a, an agenda, something that they're working toward. Uh, I think can really help me get because it always when I can't figure out what my character would do in a situation, I'm like, well, what what action puts forward their agenda? Which may be why I like playing clerics because if you've got a cleric, they've always got an agenda. <laughs> 
you know, what I find really uh, inspiring is is the things that both of you have said that that really trigger with me is Joanna brought up the idea of, of a strong choice that all your characters make. When I hear someone say things like strong choice, uh, as a GM, that always makes me just grin because characters with strong choices, it means they have a certain belief. And one thing I love to do as a GM is I love to f- challenge that belief <laughs> at some point. <laughs> challenge does not begin with yeah. an F, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> to challenge that belief. And and I always find that to be really, you know, exciting and interesting. And when uh, Elizabeth is talking about trigger points, ways to get you moving, I also, I, I really enjoy that as a GM if there's something that I can take and, and use. I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we shouldn't establish like a new a new 20 questions and, and, and just couch it in terms of things like what is your engagement anchor? What is your trigger point? <laughs> what is your belief that can be challenged? Because then you're communicating very clearly the expectations on both the player side and the GM side. Uh, like one of the things jo- Joanna was just saying is she loves it when the GM does something with that. And I think that's all too often um, something that most people don't understand about things that are flaws or disadvantages or negative qualities is that they're really a way for you to tell the GM, I want this to happen in game someday. (laughs) This is important to me. Yeah. Yeah. We, we need to do those 20 questions again, because the way you just described that, I just realized that's what I keep trying to do in all these big, long, intricate narrative backstories. I write is I keep trying to build these in. It's when I create a backstory for a character, my first thought is, okay, how can the GM take what I'm putting in here? and do something interesting with it in game. Right. And I'm, and the idea is to just to take that and just litter it with plot hooks. So if the GM says something, oh, I'm a, I was wanting to do this story, I can now draw this in. You know, and, I'm, and I'm saying if we define them in those terms, if, 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 for example, if the GM knows that trigger point means this is how I get you moving, right? Yeah. Yes. He can just look at the character sheet and, and that's going to be a lot easier for him than, than going through a whole, you know, story. Exactly. Trying like to I dig said, it out. A, or if he wants to, uh, you know, figure out a way to get you involved in an ongoing story, uh, that's where the engagement anchor pops in. And then if he wants to directly do something that might change your character in the future, that's where he challenges the belief. Yeah, See and I mean? I mean that stuff is being built into a lot of uh, indie games right. now. Is that Agreed. that that list of uh, you know this is this is my strongest held belief. This is uh, this is the thing that that I can't resist. Um, this is my weakness, and it's listed as sort of bullet points, so the GM can pick up the character sheet and say, "Oh, okay, well, that's, this is easy." Just... And then you know you get to you get to play with all of that stuff. And I, you're absolutely right, but I'm kind of excited because what we talked about here tonight speaks to me actually more clearly than a lot of games that I've seen try to address it. Sure. Yeah, everybody's trying to address it in different ways, and some are definitely more successful than others. And what we're talking about now is sort of a more informal way of doing it, which has always appealed to me as well, just because I've come from that background. I've come from um, a bunch of D&D players who love to role play, and that, you know, role playing really isn't built into the Dungeons and Dragons system. It's more like a combat simulator that people can role play in if you wish, you know, it's not really built in. And I've always come from a bunch of, I've learned from a bunch of DMs who like to build that role play into it. And it, it, it does become very sort of fast and loose and there aren't really any rules to it. And I, I do like it that way for sure. Well, it depends on which edition we're playing, but yes. Sure. Now, yeah, enough, before right. you commenters start heading to the website, gamerstavern.org, <laughs> no edition wars. <laughs> well, we, have, yes. we have a whole podcast called Edition Wars are Bullshit, so listen to that first. <laughs> yes. um, Good stuff. But anyway, moving on. Uh, so we've talked about all the, all the things that make a character fun to play, and that's you know really kind of the crux of what we've been getting at. But uh, here's a question for you. Um, is there something you do differently with someone who's a fairly rigid archetype and by rigid archetype i mean things like you know crusading clerics paladins lawful good paladin or right. i'm the the samurai razor boy from a cyberpunk game uh this the 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 space marine is another good one well that was a <laughs> and that was a, a big challenge for me yes it's like how do you, how do you make a character like that that's it, the background's kind of written into the character archetype how do, how do you make one of those interesting find a way to make it different yeah remember that they're people there's a look for the contradictions, which I think is basically another way of saying what Joanna just said. So if I am understanding you correctly, you're saying it always comes down to the human condition. Yeah. Well, it's just sort of what we were talking about right at the beginning with the mysterious stranger. That mysterious stranger is still a human being. He's somebody's son. They've probably still got things that they want, and they've probably somebody's still got things brother. that they hate, and they're probably allergic to something. <laughs> somebody's son, somebody's brother, that kind of a thing, yeah. 
and it just popped in my head. One, uh, I can't remember which term we picked for it, but uh, the the idea of the conflict between uh, was it uh, trigger points was the one where it's basically you've got this guy who's lawful good paladin. What is it about him that would make him turn away from that? Uh, challenging the um, no, it's the other one. Challenging the challenging uh, beliefs. Yeah. Challenging beliefs. Yeah. Ethical dilemmas are great. Well, I'm going to go out on the limb here, and since we have some some very well read people on, I'm just going to say the Deed of Paxinarian by Elizabeth Moon is a wonderful exploration of what it means to be a paladin, and introduces an awful lot of ways you can question, for example, those rigid character types, and you know get them get them to think more deeply about the things that they hold dear to their character. Yeah, and that's a character who is totally lawful good. Uh, well, she didn't. She was, she, but the thing, the, like how she got there, I yes. think is, is really the really interesting. To me, that's the part that I, I love about Paxinarian is because you're you're reading about paladins and you're like, well, they don't feel any fear, and you're like, oh, well, that's kind of cool. And then you yes. sort of Paxinarian asks the question, well, how do you get to a place where you feel no fear? And the answer that Elizabeth Moon came up with was that you have to feel you have to feel terror before you can learn to defy it. Which I thought was a wonderful. That was a really wonderful lesson, you know. And, and you can take that into any character and, and look at look at what they do and how they got there and, and sort of question it that way. Think of the most cliched, you know, archetype the the Arlie Ermy drill instructor. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what is your major malfunction? <laughs> take, but don't get me started. I can quote. Oh my god. Way. The TV show he used to do on the History Channel was one of my great guilty pleasures of all time. Uh, Mail call. Mail call. Yeah, yeah, it was basically it. just Mail Arlie Ermey blowing shit up on, on very thin excuse. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was like Mythbusters without the thin veneer of science. <laughs> um, but seriously, if you take five drill instructors and sit them down at a table – they have a conversation, you will discover that they are all actually different people. So th- they may all suit that archetype, but there's there's other stuff going on there. That's a really good way to think about it. Well, I, you know, I have actually been in the military and learned, you know, that drill instructors are not all the same <laughs> with first hand. So <laughs> <laughs> the hard way. <laughs> But that actually leads us to another really interesting point is that can you take a character concept and make it interesting and new if you are stealing that character from popular culture, like Arlie Ermey? Or how can you make Dritzt not a Dritzt clone, pretty much? I can do something interesting with that same concept. Well, sometimes taking a character like that, taking a really stereotypical character and placing it in the environment that your your game master has created for you. If you're really, really open to the environment, sometimes it can be really neat to see how you think that character would react to what the, what the game master is giving you. Again, I mean, cloning a character directly out of popular culture isn't really all that much fun as far as I'm concerned. But uh, but oftentimes, you know, it has to do with situation. I mean, if you're really open to it and you take Drizzt and you put him in a new situation, maybe he would do some pretty interesting things and you'd be able to sort of explore it that way. Like, what do you stayed? The sort of lawful, chaotic, good, whatever the hell they ended up deciding that was. <laughs> Would he, would he have kept that mentality if he didn't have the anchor of people who did accept him for who he was and not what he was? Sure, like that could be very interesting. Would, yeah. w- would that have eventually driven him to start acting out? Yeah. If he had never met that uh, the ranger that mentored him, if he had never met, I always screw up his name, the dwarf. Bruner. Thank you. Bruner Battlehammer. Hmm. <laughs> One way I like to do it is if there's something about a character that I really like character, con- I, I'm a huge Dresden Files fan, Jim Butcher. And my backup character, in case my Shadowrun character gets killed, is actually a paranormal investigator in the Shadowrun world who wears a big long trench coat and has a giant ass revolver. <laughs> Gee, I wonder where I got that idea from. <laughs> but what I did to try to kind of differentiate myself was I actually looked at it and uh, this should, the link is going to be in the show notes. So warning now, TV tropes link ahead. <laughs> Because that is a well you will fall down oh, in and die. Oh, yeah. Turn oh. back. Saturday action is in Turn there now. Back. It's very exciting. Oh, sweet. I know. I felt like I made it. <laughs> <laughs> so if any listeners want to start a Gamer's Tavern Tropes one, uh, <laughs> feel free to email me. I can help you out some. But what I like to do is kind of look at the character in terms of the fictional character, in terms of their tropes. What is it about this character in trope form that attracts me to it? 
and then I kind of break it down into its essentials and then build off from there. And usually I'll end up with something that's not quite as cookie cutter playing the exact same character again, except for I'm not the writer. So it ends up like bad fan fiction. <laughs> well, there's, there's something to be said though, for, for selecting a character for popular culture that is different or unique or just, you know, maybe even not so well known in our particular culture and, and finding a way to bring that out. For example, at Genghis Khan, I played uh, El Santo, the luchador, uh, which <laughs> I am not a very familiar with that, that culture, but I found that character. And of course, he's like the most like popular. He's like the Superman of, of luchadors. He's, everybody knows El Santo. And, uh, you know, I thought he was a really interesting guy. And if I were to extrapolate El Santo into another role-playing game, I think I could do it. And I think I would do, I think I would be bringing across what makes El Santo special without, without everyone needing to know who he is or where he's from. I, I may be messing this up. I think I, I think I haven't quite communicated as clearly as I'd like to, but, uh, I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. I think another thing too that um, that people don't really think about when they say, "Oh, I want to play Mal from Firefly in my game. I want to I want to build him and play him." Is that um, as soon as you take that character and as soon as you start playing with him, he's going to be different because he's you, which is a big thing that I experienced when I cast for our show. For like, I built these four characters, which were basically you know archetypal in their own way. There was a lot of there was a lot of stuff about them that was very stereotypical. And then you assign an actor to the role, and then all of a sudden it becomes different than you ever imagined it would be. So sure, it's still got those same characteristics that you know that, that it needs to have, but it just becomes three-dimensional, and, you, and it becomes you playing the character. It's always going to be different than the actor that you see on the screen or, or the, the character that's in the book that you love. Because even Mal isn't really Mal. Mal is Joss Whedon's idea of Mal filtered through whichever writer wrote that episode, filtered through Nathan Fillion, filtered through the editor. Absolutely. So all of that comes into play. And so you're never going to be playing that exact representation of that character again. And and that's that's great. That means you're going to you're going to do a lot of exploring. Yeah. And characters drift as you play them as well, which is good. It's character development, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. Um, yeah, that's this is that's that's part of the plan. One thing I like to do is take popular culture and use it as a shorthand to sort of give you the idea, the tone, or maybe the main idea that I'm 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 reaching for, without necessarily meaning I'm going to Xerox copy it. I'll give you an example: Valkyrie Two, who I'm going to be playing in the upcoming Avengers game. Uh, somebody asked me, "Well, what's she like?" And I said, "Well, I the image I have in my head is basically Aquaman from Batman: Brave and the Bold." which I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but he's very over the top. He's, he's extremely heroic and over the top. And, and, and that's kind of cool. I, that attracts me. And they said, well, what's your, what's your biggest flaw? And I said, well, I thought it would be interesting to be legally blonde. And they said, what do you mean by legally blonde? And I said, well, there's just something about this character, the way that she looks, that she just simply cannot, she finds it difficult to be taken seriously. She may, maybe she has the really high voice, you know, <laughs> maybe she's got, you know, just that cherubic, you know, teenager, you know, look to her that just most people are like, yeah, yeah, whatever, kid. <laughs> uh, but I think I think that's going to be an interesting flaw to play with a really heroic, over the top character. Um, so I'm using popular culture there in two places, just as a shorthand to sort of get across what I'm talking about. Sure. Well, it is it is the uh, the the vocabulary that we all share. It's the elevator pitch for the character. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, we're we're approaching last call. So let's just ask our guests and Daryl, I'm going to include you in this. What are your final tips if you were just to give someone say, you know, one, two, three tips to make an interesting character, what would they be? Want something, definitely. The contradiction thing, which I think plays into what Ross was just saying. Make your character not just want something, but make them care about something. Give give them something that they love. That's another great motivation that I don't think anybody has has mentioned yet. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is a very good point. Very good point. Jo- Joanna or Daryl, what did, what were your top tips? Whew, well, <laughs> you jumped on those. <laughs> that's why I got in there fast. I know. I saw that. that was very smart. Victory! <laughs> and I'm stuck going. I made my initiative so. roll. <laughs> if you guys. Phil, I've got I've got to back up and fill in the gaps <laughs> and grade something. If you guys need some time, I can actually throw mine out there. No, it's okay. I I think uh, what's already been said, sort of the the goals and and the flaws and that kind of stuff, is uh, is fantastic for sure. And I agree with them. Another thing that I would say that is really important to character creation and and character development is listening, allowing yourself 
to change. Allowing yourself to come in with a character idea and have it change entirely or somewhat. I think that that's a real, that's a real strength when you're coming in with a character. Don't feel like you have to be really specific and solid and immovable on all of your decisions. No, no, no. It's, it's completely fine to come into a situation and have all of your decisions change. Um, another thing that I would say is to, yeah, make, make strong choices. I mean, make a decision and, and try your best to, to see where it takes you, even if it takes you to places that you didn't think it was going to go. <laughs> and another one which we haven't actually brought up is a really good rule from improv, um, improv stage Don't acting or, or whatever. Don't block. Don't block. Exactly. Yes, and. Uh, so if somebody offers you something, uh, pick it up. I mean, why not, right? I mean, try not to uh, try not to block them. Try not to uh, to shut them down. If somebody, another character in the group, is is giving you an opportunity to explore another area of your character, why not take it? Who knows, right? It oftentimes really interesting things come up. Wow, you're super I, smart. I've, <laughs> yeah, I've heard I've heard yes and many times. I've never heard uh, don't block. Yeah, That's same a sort of thing. One I've heard thing. before. Right? Yeah. I think we've actually talked about it on the show before, is the idea of don't block someone. So do you have any wrong? I, I did. Um, and these are really ones that I've, I've held for a long time, but I kind of refined them just by listening to Elizabeth and Joanna discuss them. Uh, number one is when you, when you make a character, uh, do it with some context of what your group's going to be like. I think, and again, this is not a for all groups all the time suggestion. This is just for you know, people who, who find it to be useful to make characters that work together in a group. Do it with some context. The second one I would say is, you know, look at the trends that you, you make characters under. Try to, ide- I try to identify the, the tropes that, that you are most comfortable with, just so that you understand, you know, uh, more about your... Maybe it says something about you, maybe it just says something about the way you have fun, but I think it's really important to your understanding. Because the last thing I would say is, do not fear to try something new. Don't be afraid to go out there and say, maybe, you know, once you've identified things that, that are, uh, you know, maybe your, your go-to's, uh, don't be afraid to try breaking out of that sometime and see see what it does for you. Daryl? Okay. Uh, one thing I kind of wanted to build on that you were just touching on is expanding your base of what you know. One thing that I have, when I was a kid, I loved playing whatever I liked to play. Now that I've gotten older, this started about probably three, four, five years ago, I, I used to, when I started off, I liked playing Street Samurai and Shadowrun because I wanted to be the biggest badass ever and sit there and crunchy, pick out the right cyberware to make myself badass. And I was 13, 14 years old, so I sucked at character optimization then. So I ended up with kind of boring, flat characters. I ended up with the man with no name who had no name and no past and didn't <laughs> care about his past, so he was boring. He was a collection of stats. That's what I was talking about way back almost two hours ago. But... Now, I really like that style of character. I like playing the paladin. I like playing the lawful good cleric. I like playing uh, the dwarf. And I like playing them to type for the most part because I like exploring and finding how to make these characters that are so established and so rigid and find what makes them interesting and cool and not play them to type per se. Sure, my dwarf may be... He loves to mine, he loves the earth, and he wants all the gold, and he hates elves. But what else is there to him? Sure, he's still a dwarf, and he's still a stereotypical dwarf, but he's still an individual. Where can I kind of sand down the rough edges and find the humanity in the character? The other big tip I would give anyone, regardless of what you're playing is and this is something that i don't know if we actually brought up is don't just worry about this in character generation evolve your character as you're playing if you're playing a long-term campaign you want things to happen to your character that changes them that grows them and you can build those in right from the start that's what ross and i did with our two characters the we had this idea of a character arc where my character is the stiff upper lip guy, dirt, always by the book. You run like this and you do not do, you do not get seen and blah, blah, blah. And he's the guy who grew up on blow up everything action movies pretty much. And that's what he thinks he's supposed to be doing. And, and I'm not doing a bad job of that so far, actually. <laughs> we are blowing up an awful lot of stuff. You're stabbing a lot of people. I'm blowing up an awful lot of stuff. Yeah, okay. Same difference. Same difference. <laughs> Team effort. I get an assist on that. Yes. Now, that, now here's the thing, though. That was part of my idea for the character was that 
my character would start to see how Ross's character sees the world and he would start to change and evolve. He would get into these situations where, okay, being the staunch, professional, cold badass isn't going to cut it here. You've got to be the over the top guy. You've got to be the one that takes that chance that isn't the good risk. And that's how pretty much all these, every single buddy cop movie works that way. The two parties learn from each other and they grow. And that was built in. And that also comes up with all these other things we talked about, motivations and uh, trigger points. We built a trigger point as we were playing the game, at least my character did, where in the very first episode, there was a corp kid who screwed us over. He sold us out to a bunch of gangers. And we just got in the last session we played, which you guys haven't heard this yet, spoiler alert, we got a tidbit of information about how to find him. And that gave us something to move for. Okay, say we're on a mission where this corp kid lives. Do we stay strict? My character has to look. Do I stay strictly on mission and accomplish what we're going to do and get out clean? Or do I swing by the 19th floor where this kid's apartment is and kind of put the fear of God into him? And my character is going to have to question his belief of going straight And this is something that came organically as we were playing. Look for those moments. Okay. Well, uh, we are now at last call, so I'm going to ask uh, Elizabeth and Joanna to just once again tell our listeners about their latest thing and where they can find them. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, my latest thing. Well, I mean, third season of my web series, Standard Action, is going to be coming out this year. The first two seasons are online for free. You can find them at standardaction.com. Uh, Starlet Citadel is an ongoing series where we review board games. Uh, you can find that on the Starlet Citadel YouTube channel. Um, yeah, those are the big ones. Those are the big ones. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm a huge fan of both of them. <laughs> fantastic. So. Fantastic. So, I, uh, tell me, Joanna, have you guys done a review of Pandemic? Oh, yes. That was one of our, one of our very <laughs> earliest ones, actually, for sure. That's a, it's, a, it's a running gag. Inside joke. It's a running gag on gaming podcasts about Pandemic, just because I'm good friends with the guys of the D6 generation who have always said that someday they will review Pandemic and... Uh, for six as, years, six years. As yet, has not occurred. So. <laughs> I love that game. It's a great game. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just it's a it's just a running joke. So that's all. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, have you guys reviewed Kingsburg? Uh, yes. Yep. I have to check that out. It's one of my favorite board games. Ah. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. No, we've done. I think we have. Uh, yeah, over ninety episodes now. So so quite quite a few games have gone have gone through for sure. All right. And Elizabeth, what's your latest thing, and where can we find you on the webs? Okay, you can find me on the webs at, at www.elizabethbear.com. Um, and I am Matto Sequala on every uh, social networking platform known to humankind. Uh, her, Tumblr, her Tumblr feed is especially interesting. Um, why, thank you. Uh, it, it's M A T O C I Q U A L A, and it's a Google singleton. So wherever you find that, yes, even on Usenet posts from 1994, it will be me. <laughs> <laughs> I, my, Is that I by apologize chance one of your for role playing game characters. Hmm. Is that by chance one of your RPG characters? No, no, it's not. It's the Dakota word for little bear. Ah. So, <laughs> and I'm, I'm the only person on the internet using that as a handle, so I'm keeping it. Um, <laughs> never <laughs> underestimate the power of having a unique username. <laughs> From the guy whose username is abstruse? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm Mighty Joanna on everything. And it's amazing how, how there, there's no one else doing it. So It's yours now. It is. It's mine. Do you, do you do the thing where whenever you discover a new social pl social networking platform, even if you're not planning on using it, you go and stake out your name? Yes. <laughs> I totally do that. <laughs> I should wow, do I that. I'm going to start yeah. doing that. I, I have to. I have to. I squat yeah, well, it. <laughs> you have started a new trend. Yep. And what's your, your latest your latest thing again? Um, well, I, I, I actually bragged this up uh, earlier, um, but I will do it again. The uh, Steelies of the Sky, which is the book that's coming out, uh, April 8th. Uh, there are two other books in the series, in the trilogy. It is complete with this third book, so now is a great time to buy it and convince my publisher that they really want to pick up my proposal. Uh, <laughs> 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 and, uh, 
the other thing is that uh, the Shadow Unit is actually coming up on its series finale after seven years. Um, there are only three more episodes, and that's uh, shadowunit.org. I did it correctly this time. <laughs> yes. Nice. <laughs> Well, from Daryl and I, we both want to say thank you very much for both of you for joining us on the show. It's been wonderful having you. We'd love to have you back sometime on the show. Um, Absolutely. Just, It'd be great. We're very yeah. fun. This was super fun. Well, thank you, guys. We really appreciate that. And uh, Oh, my that, God. You're nerds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with that, we're going to bring this episode of the Gamer's Tavern to a close. From now on, may all your hits be crits. Woo! Well, that about wraps things up for this episode of the Gamer's Tavern. Comments time. Uh, Steven Rogers was amazingly nice. He left us a comment letting us know that for, I think, like five days, the links on our Cyberpunk episode show notes uh, were broken. All the ones going to drive through RPG weren't showing the HTTP at the front, so it was taking you to our 404 page at GamersTavern.org. That was a bug I thought I'd fixed. Apparently, I didn't. I fixed it now. So, if you attempted to go to any of the links in our Cyberpunk episode and you couldn't get through episode 22, go ahead and try them again now. We've got them fixed. I apologize about that. And again, thank you very much, Stephen, for letting us know. And if you happen to find anything like that going on in any of our episodes or if we make some sort of mistake, please leave a comment or email me at abstruse at gamerstavern.org and let us know because if we do something wrong, we want to fix it. We also have a comment from Walks and Sings about the Gamers Tavern Game Table, which is our Shadowrun actual play podcast uh, that goes up every Monday. So if you want to check that out, please do. But uh, he says, that was a lot of fun. Aside from the breathing being a little bit loud, the sound was perfectly okay. I am now in love with Rafe and will probably make him an NPC in my Amazonia campaign if Mr. Watson is okay with it. Anyways, I'm very happy I stumbled upon the tavern. Can't wait to listen to the other sessions. Cheers. Oh, thank you a lot, Walks and Sings. Unless you're podcasting your campaign as well, uh, Ross and I have absolutely no problems with you using Rafe. Uh, if you are hoping to record and podcast or live stream or anything like that, your Shadowrun campaign, please just let us know so we can work out some sort of you know cross-promotion thing. We'll link you. You link us. Anyway... If you want to use him, or if anyone else wants to use Ray or any of our other player characters as NPCs in their own campaign, uh, we're slowly working through and posting all the characters on the website. A uh, Rafe in specific is in the show notes for, I believe, episode two of the Gamers Tavern game table. And uh, Babysitter's rough draft version, his original build. Uh, I've rebuilt him since, but you guys won't find out how things changed for, I think, another four weeks. But uh, his initial build is up on episode four of the Game Table podcast. So if you want to check that out, go to those show notes. There's a link to the PDF in there, courtesy of Hero Labs, which if you haven't checked out Hero Labs, amazing character creation software. So yeah, definitely check them out. Anyway, th that's all the comments for this week. It actually goes pretty fast when, you know, I do them weekly like I'm supposed to and not let a month's worth build up. Huh. I have to actually do my job properly from now on. Uh, anyway, uh, there's one other thing I wanted to tell you about. Well, two things, actually. But the first is the most important. Ross, who you may know, Ross Watson, the host of the Gamers Tavern, uh, he's looking to move to Denver, and he's doing so with a couple of friends of his who are also friends of the show and former guests, Sean Patrick Fannin and Corinne Seabolt. They have some really, really great reasons to move to Denver. Uh, the biggest, healthcare. See, freelance designers and people who own their own small businesses don't have access to easy or inexpensive health care. And where they currently live, they're having problems getting proper health insurance. Moving to Denver, especially Colorado's laws, will help them out immensely. And that's on top of the larger gaming community in Denver the upgrading schools for their children and there's just so many reasons for them to move there it's a great move for them and if you want to help them out they have set up a gofundme campaign and they're not just asking for you know flat out handouts there are many reward levels 
and you can get some really great stuff. PDF games, signed books. If you're in the Denver area, they have rewards that include them actually running games they designed for you. So that's pretty awesome. So definitely check that out. It's over at GoFundMe.com slash Big Denver Adventure. That's GoFundMe.com slash Big Denver Adventure. And they're already halfway to their base goal in less than a week, which is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for your support. But uh, that's about it for the Gamers Tavern this week. Uh, The Gamers Tavern is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 license. Music for the animation celebration is Undead Blues by Unknown Henson, copyright 2012, used with permission. Until next time, the tavern is closed. 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 Closed.